All right, welcome to Good Choices. This is my catchphrase on this channel. I <laughs> do my best to live by it, but um, anyone uh, with a career in anything uh, or just who has lived for enough time to <laughs> have some base level of consciousness, anyone past the age of like four years old will know that it's, you know, a lot of things are up to luck and to chance and you try the best to make the best choices you can and prepare yourself the best you can. But in the end, um, there's only so much you can do. Um, I think the key thing is to, you know, make bets in your favor and then make as many of those bets as you can in your favor. So just, just um, keep taking risks um, and uh, if you're doing all the right things, uh, it's just a matter of time before that pays off for you, even if you have some bad luck here and there. And and the the if you, there's a a video called from uh, uh, Veritasium, which I, I I'll link in the. I want to keep this about um, technical, but it, it's would you take this bet by uh, Veritasium? absolutely uh, uh, absolutely kind of a, a yeah I think this is this is the one so this is kind of a life-changing video for me um, and it's opening it in Facebook unfortunately there see him would sorry and I'm kind of wasting time here so would you take this bet? by Veritasium, um, uh, yeah, okay, on, on YouTube, I'd rather have it on YouTube, so then I can have the link, so this is kind of a, um, you know, a, a earth-shattering, groundbreaking video to me, because psychological literature shows that we are more sensitive to small losses than small gains, uh, with more, pe more people, most people valuing a loss around one point five to 2.5 times as much as a gain. This means that we will often turn down reasonable opportunities for fear of loss. However, over the course of our lives, we will be exposed to many risks and opportunities. And this invariable means invariably means that taking every small reasonable bet will uh, leave us better off than saying no to all of them. So you, so basically what this means is you have to have some level of, you have to feel like, if you always feel like, you, you know, everything you do is a sure thing, you're not taking any risks, you know, you're bound to fail because, um, you know, you, you need to, um, you you know, uh, yeah, so, so anything that seems reasonable, that seems like, hey, this is a good deal, you know, this will work out for me, but with the caveat of, you know, it's not a sure thing, just, you, you gotta take, you gotta immediately jump on, um, because, you know, if it does turn out to be, uh, a, uh, a small gain, hey, you know, you've got money in the bank, you've got, you know, professional experience, like, you've got a small gain, like, that's huge. But if it turns out to be a s small loss, even though it's really going to hurt and, like, you know, ride on you, but that's where, like, med meditation comes into play, that's where, like, you know, having hobbies come into play, it's going to hurt, it's just the way the brain is designed, but it's not going to um, uh, hurt uh, over the long term, those small gains over the long term are going to add up and those small losses are not because the, the odds are in your favor. So, you know, if you flip a coin and, and say, if it's heads, uh, you pay me 50, if it's tails, I pay you 10, um, you know, the odds are in my favor. So like, let's do it. Um, okay. It's heads. I, I gained 50. Great. Oh, it's tails. I lost 10. Well, you know what? 
it was worth it to to gain that 50 and if we were to flip the coin five times uh you know and i lose all five times i pay you 50 but if i lose one time then the next worst scenario is that i pay you uh ten dollars for each time i lose which there's only four remaining times so i walk away with ten dollars if i uh, only win one time and lose four times so i hope that makes sense and uh that that's you know a better way to think about failure and think about losses is what are the odds did it make sense to do this even though i lost um, because I think as that coin flip scenario demonstrates, you can be in a situation where even though you lost four times in a row and you had to pay $40, you can end up walking away with $10 just for you know winning one time. So, But if you just say, nope, I'm, I'm not going to keep going, I'm just going to stop at, uh, at one uh, coin flip, um, then you don't get uh, the same thing. And then, of course, it's the other way around. You, you've you've got to know if something's in your favor or not in order for this to work because, you know, if you if it's that uh, heads, I pay you $50, uh, tails, you only pay me 10 uh, you know, that's a big loss with a small gain. So if, if I pay you $50 for, for uh, losing it once, uh, now you walk away with uh, 10 because you only pay me at most uh, $40. And, you know, my I, I could walk away with 50 if I win big, but the odds of that aren't uh, aren't likely. So, yeah, you got to be uh, aware of what the odds are. Um, and then once you uh, determine um, to the best of your ability that the odds are in your favor go 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 just keep doing it doing it doing it doing it and uh the small gains will always offset the small losses because the odds are in your favor and then it sucks to lose uh everyone hates it uh it can really weigh on you but you know if you're doing all the right things um the key is to just keep doing them because no matter how unlucky you are, there's just a point where mathematically the odds are so much in your favor that it's just a matter of time. And, you know, that example, you win $50 um, just for winning once, and then you have the worst luck in the world after that. You lose four times in a row. You walk away with $10 regardless. All right, so hopefully that was helpful. A little bit off topic, but um, for me, it's, it's helpful to talk about this stuff because... I definitely struggle with, uh, you know, do struggle against my own biology. We're, we're set up for, <laughs> you know, a a uh, ecosystem that does not contain uh, pizza to your door <laughs> in thirty minutes or less, uh, with the click of a button, um, and uh, you know, computers. So. Um, all right, so moving on, um, we're going into uh, the next section, which is looking deeper into files. So the octal dump OD command is often used for debugging applications and various files. By itself, the OD octal dump command will just list out a file's contents in octal format. We can use our ftu.txt file from earlier to practice with this command. All right, and let's do that. I gotta pull up my lab. And I, I feel like I should macro this. Um, I, what am I using, bash? No, I, I don't even know how to macro it in like PowerShell or whatever that is. So I'm not gonna macro it for now, but that would be a good thing to do later. Okay, so let's dump out the file in octal format. So OD, which stands for octal dump, ftu.txt, and there we go. Um, uh, yep, so it's the same. Uh, oh, actually, it looks a little bit different. Um, I don't see the 4.4. I see 4.3. 
And I see 6-3. I wonder if I modified this in the last video. Uh, let's do the... Let's review what we learned, and then we're going to do the command. Uh, 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 oh, shoot. I don't remember. It's okay to use my history because uh, on the job and stuff, if you have it in your history, and hopefully you'll be putting in things like uh, bash scripts or, or <laughs> even better, uh, internal documentation so that like you don't forget um, how to do these. If, if, if you're trying to... Uh, rely on your memory and be like oh this is what i did yesterday because i remember it you're bound to fail and then not only that it's not a uh, modular knowledge you can't pass it on to someone else uh because it just exists in your memory sending links is like in my opinion the productivity superpower it's like just some send, send somebody a link to the uh documentation and, and not only that, you know, that shortens the message way down and it puts the message in a centralized, distributed place where then they can send the link. You know, they don't have to screen scrape what you send them and then clean up the formatting. You know, they just send the link. Okay, so the file looks like it's okay. It's the same checksum as that file. Um, but for some reason, the octal dump uh, is different. Uh, we've got... Uh, the first uh, two are different, are the same, and then the rest is different. So the first column of uh, output is the byte offset. Um, okay, so yeah, we can see that matches here. For each line in the output. Okay, so it looks like it reads in columns and rows, so we've got... Um, one, two, three, uh, six, seven, eight columns. One, two, three, six, seven, eight columns. Last column uh, is is empty. Um, but then uh, we have this column here. It looks like everything matches except for like these two here. These these last ones uh, match. Um, but we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, columns. And then we've got uh, eight rows just like in the documentation or the the learning materials so since octal dump od prints out information in octal format by default each line begins with the byte offset of eight bits followed by eight columns each containing the octal value of the data within that column so tip recall that a byte is eight bits in length yep so that that's important now these are uh, octal uh uh octal these are octal bits uh i think i wait so this is an octal dump and this is in octal format so this is not in in binary format and if we were to convert it to binary um so let's see here so this is octal format um okay yeah 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 so each each of these is a is an octet um and and we should remember um from our uh you know ccna stuff uh variable length subnetting uh what this is so uh this here is a byte a byte is uh, eight bits, so we we represent um, the bits. Uh, I think I'm actually a little bit confused. Uh, so so yeah, so it's so a byte is eight bits in length. Um, uh, each each line begins with the byte offset of. 8 bits um, followed by 8 columns containing the octal value of the data within that column so like this shows I think that um, you know the this the sequence the offset so like um, shoot let me let me take out a notepad and and uh, I'm going to convert this. What I'm going to do is convert this to bits 
just just with my own understanding and then check that understanding using like a calculator or something so here's the here's my understanding of, of what this is in bits and so so my understanding is that it's uh for uh it, it's representing three bytes and then the first byte uh uh, and then I'm, I'm going to write out each uh, byte in bits. There we go. Um, so so it's uh, 8 uh, bits per byte. Um, this one only has 7. So 6 more to this. There we go. 8 bits for per byte. And then the first uh, uh, bit is a value of... Uh, Hmm, okay. The so this octal dump, so it's octal numbers. Um I feel like I'm kind of confused here. So what happens if there's if these are all uh nines? Because it it's an octal number, so like uh I think nine is the highest. Or, or is eight the highest? I, I only see sevens. I don't see any nines or eights. Um, I feel like eight would be the highest because if these are, so each, each of these represents a byte, right? Um, and then bytes, the, the maximum number of a byte would be, uh, so the the this would represent a two, uh, and that yeah. So you could you could represent a value of two with uh, ones and zeros, four, uh, eight, uh, sixteen. So the, so the the max would be um, sixteen um, that you could represent. So we're representing. Uh, shoot, I'm kind of rusty on this actually. It's been a while because you you know you just use a calculator, use your tools. Using tools is good. So should you need to view a file's content contents in hexadecimal format, use the dash x format. Okay, so let's take a look at it in hexadecimal format. Hopefully that will jog my memory. Okay, so here it is in, in hexadecimal, um, so it's shrink down to uh, four characters. Each each character represents a byte now instead of a bit from what I understand. So this is um, four, so the maximum value would be an, an F, yep, representing a value of 16. So it's, it's a byte, it looks, it looks like this with the values zero and one representing uh, two, uh, and then um, uh, actually it looks like this if it's a byte yeah so uh oh wait no 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 no, no sorry uh it's it's like this and then and then you have uh four uh places and then uh if you want to represent the value of uh 16 uh it's all on and and it's actually uh even though it's 16 characters, it's it's 15. So if you really want to represent the the value of 16, then you need an extra. So you need uh, this, uh, and then you need one more zero because this is the 16th uh, place. So so this represents uh, decimal 16, but uh, it's the 17th uh, value uh, in the um, sequence because the sequence starts at zero. It's like fence post errors, you know, learning about that sort of thing. Okay, so now each of the eight columns in the, after the op byte offset are represented by their hexadecimal equivalents. One handy use of the OD command is for debugging scripts. For example, the octal dump OD command can show us characters that are not normally seen that exist within a file such as new line entries. We can do this with the dash C option so that instead of displaying the numerical notation for each byte, 
these column entries will instead be shown their character equivalents, their true character, true colors, <gasps> which is not always pretty. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, uh, so uh, OD dash uh, C now. So so we did dash X. We did just the regular octal dump. So we got these octal numbers. Then we got to the um, uh, hexadecimal numbers. Uh, now we're getting the the characters. So uh, this this is uh, representing a character uh, B, uh, probably in, in ASCII. So let's let's get some calculators, some converters up. So we're gonna say convert uh, 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 octal to decimal, and then we'll, yep, and then we'll get a convert uh, hexadecimal to decimal, and then we'll get a convert ASCII. There we go. So uh, uh, we're going to convert uh, ASCII to text. We're going to convert uh, hexadecimal to decimal. And then we're going to convert uh, octal to decimal. Then we should get all the same results. So here's the octal number. Let's convert it. Uh, decimal number is 7A62. And there we go. 7A62 looks good to me. Here's the hexadecimal number. Um, we already got the conversion, but we'll do it anyway. And uh, the octal number for uh, 7A62 is 31330. Oh, and it, okay, it's different. So um, yeah, that's a good thing that we uh, did that. Um, so the reason it's it's not uh, the same is because we converted it to decimal, not octal. So let's try it again, converting it to uh, octal. All right, so now that it's octal, it's 75142. Let's see if that matches. 75142, great, it drops the leading zero, that's totally fine. Uh, we also do have the decimal number 31330, and uh, that does match the uh, conversion from octal to decimal, um, and then it gives you the hex automatically for free. Okay, so last thing, we're gonna convert uh, ASCII to uh, text. So the ASCII, um, uh, okay, see, so I think the ASCII is, is represented in uh, binary, um, but uh, let's let's try to to um, to try. Okay, so that doesn't work. I think it has to be fed uh, binary to uh, convert it properly. Oh, and there's very loud leaf blowing. Apologize if that shows up. Uh, eh, not bad. We're at about 40. My voice is long enough. I've got my big uh, work tunes headphones. I might um, put that in the um, description as well. I'm going to put that Veritasium video in the description for sure. Just I think this this should be earth earth shattering for for people, in the same way it was for me, and then also put this uh, work tunes, uh, in the in the uh, headset because if you're you know if you got leaf blowers, right outside your very thin uh, window, um, hey, you know seventy six bucks a hundred under a hundred bucks, uh, not bad at all, and the uh, twenty four. Uh, noise reduction rating it's like you know you get the radio uh, there's an integrated microphone but the microphone sounds like you're underwater um, it's it's really um, it's really muddy um, and bad but it's enough to get by there's actually nicer ones um, that have a better uh, uh, microphone um, Uh, I, I forget uh, what it is, uh, but uh, 
this isn't exactly off topic, uh, it kind of is, but it, you know, this, this channel is about learning. It's about studying. And if you have a leaf blower blowing wind in your face, uh, <laughs> you know, put on uh, a pair of headphones like these and, and keep, uh, keep going. All right. So, uh, uh, the octal dump od command is often used for debugging applications of various files um, which we read uh, before so we're all the, all the way down here so it's handy for debugging uh, scripts for example the od command will show us uh, which are not normally in the file um, we can do this with the dash c option so that instead of displaying the numerical notation for each byte these column entries will instead be shown as their character equivalents. Okay, great. Um, one thing I am going to do, um, and I can pause the video to do this. Uh, I should be able to do it really quick. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. You know what? I don't even need to pause. So um, if things are really bad. So these these are great, but I have, I have another pair. Um, so if I type in 3M NRR, um, I have another pair here. Uh, that are 31 NRR, and that's pretty much like the max. But you know, 42 under 50 dollars, you know, it's it's cheaper, um, and it's better. Now, there's no features on these; it's a pure noise blocker, um, so there's no no headphones or anything. But hey, look, it's on it's on sale for 32 as well. Like, if you just want something cheap and effective for blocking out sound while you're studying and you, you don't care about listening to the radio or making calls or anything, you just need that peace of mind and that quiet and the leaf blowers to not be uh, blowing wind in your face. Uh, or if they are, then just worrying about the sensation of the wind and not about the sound. Um, these are a good bet, uh, especially for the money. So I'm gonna switch over to using those. Oh, that, there we go, and, and bring it on. Now, now all you gotta worry about is <laughs> the sound of your own uh, blood pumping and beating heart and your brain's uh, electrical <laughs> or like if you have any ringing in your ears or anything like that that's the only annoyances you'll be dealing with um, I love it <laughs> okay so um, all of all of the new line entries within the file are represented by the hidden backslash n characters if you just want to view all of the characters within a file and do not need to see the byte offset information. The byte offset column can be removed from the output um, like like uh, so. So this uh, dash capital A, uh, dash N, um, byte offset. Let's do the dash C first. There we go, and we've got the characters including the special characters here for the new lines. And you know what, let's take a look. B, Z, D, O, G, new line, D, O, G, new line, C, U, 2, look familiar? Yeah, because it's printing out the actual characters in the file. If we do a cat in the file, the actual characters are as such. So, you know, this is a great way to see these uh, special characters that are unlisted in the actual file. If you want to see what's, what's actually there, um, why things are, especially in Python, if if you you know you're doing string manipulation in Python and it's like why is it not working? It's like oh because there's an extra new line that uh, you're not seeing and that only shows up when you inspect the file in a deeper way. All right, so now let's move on to the next uh, uh, switch, which is uh, capital A lowercase n. There we go. So now we don't have that. Uh, column marker which might be helpful for scripting or like whatever um, you want to do um, like for example let me demo something here so I can do uh, import a sub process and then say uh, a file equals file contents equals uh, sub process underscore check output Uh, or uh, uh, check wait what is it oh dot 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 sorry check output and then um, uh, we're gonna do uh, od slash capital a n c uh, f t u dot txt 
uh, shell equals true. Um, okay, and now we've got a uh, type uh, file contents. There we go. It's now a string. So let's print out the string file contents. And there's the string is exactly what's in there. But now we can do print uh, and then join join everything together. Join file contents. Uh, oh, uh, we're going to join it with uh, whatever characters are separating it. So it looks like there's one, two, three spaces separating each character. So let's join it together using three spaces. Uh, wait, I'm confused. Why is it making it bigger? Oh, you know what? Uh, this is this is why. Um, so I, okay, in order to join it together, because we're we're joining these characters together with an extra three spaces, and if we join it together without, you know, anything, then we'll join it together with three spaces and just do the same thing. So if we want to uh, reconstruct the file through string manipulation in Python. Uh, this is what we need to do. So for uh, character in uh, file contents uh, dot split, and then we're going to split on the one, two, three, three uh, spaces, um, uh, and then and then we want to strip it uh, so that we don't have those uh, uh, characters one, two, three, four. Uh, now what we're going to do is. Uh, uh, say uh, 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 so um, reconstructed file equals uh, and then a list comprehension character uh, Uh, and we can do this whole thing in a list comprehension. So let's do that instead. So we're going to say uh, a a we're going to say reconstructed file equals a uh, character for character dot strip in file contents dot split. One, two, three. Uh, can't assign function to call. Okay. Uh, actually, it, it's like this. I, I was close. We got to strip the strip it here. There we go. So now if we do print reconstructed file, we've got uh, a list uh, without those spaces in it. Um, so now if we do uh, print dot join reconstructed file, uh, now we truly have uh, reconstructed the file. Um, it looks like we still have uh, oh yeah because it, it, it ends like like that. Uh, so we can do like four i in this oops print i ah oh, which it's kind of, you know this this is the point is like this sort of uh string manipulation can get tricky in python you know you can be spending all your time doing this in python so this is why those commands that we saw uh like with uname uh or like uh you know which uh uh cat you know that that just give you the pure and clean answer this is why they're so valuable because you don't have to waste this time uh on string manipulation Okay, before I move on to the guided exercise, uh, I want to convert these to, to binary as well. Um, so, uh, yep, so here we go, binary. Here we go, binary. 
Um, so let's do that. And we'll just do the first, uh, the, the second column first row, which is technically the first row, the first column in the first row, because these are just the basically labeling uh, the offsets. So here's the octal number. All right, here it is in binary. Um, so then we need the hexadecimal, hexadecimal number. All right, and probably without the space, I don't think, yeah, without the space uh, makes a big difference having a space there or not. Uh, so paste it in again, remove the space, convert, there we go. So let's see how close I was. So I had uh, 8, 16, 24 characters. They have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. So they, they have 16 characters. Yeah, okay. Well, that was dumb. <laughs> yeah, it's it's 16 characters. So um, th this represents a uh, 8. Uh, uh, let's see here. So hexadecimal there. Octal there. So... Uh, oh, you know what? It, I think it does have uh, because shoot. Oh, here's the calculation. Okay, so convert each octal to three binary to three uh, binary digits. So, so yeah, a set, So I think it is twenty four. They're just leading out. Leaving out the leading zero. Oh no, they're not leaving out the leading zeros. So, uh, so each each uh, place. They are leaving out this zero. I wish they were more verbose and they didn't leave anything out. But anyway, here's how you convert octal to binary. You convert every octal digit, starting with the lowest digit, which is zero, to three binary digits, which is uh, confusing. So three, six, nine. Uh, 12, 15, 18, um, you should get, um, so for example, octal, uh, 156, uh, which is octal with this, uh, subscript eight to binary, um, equals, uh, so we just got the one here, then we need to represent a five, then we need to represent a four, and here it is in, uh, binary. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, you uh, convert uh, hex to binary um, uh, by, uh, oh, it doesn't give the same clean uh, explanation as it does before, but hex is uh, every four binary digits uh, is one uh, hex digit. All right, so now I think I can put in the binary number, hopefully, and get the character. It's probably not ASCII as actually. Um, maybe it's uh, you know what it is. It's uh, UTF or it's it's Unicode Unicode because it's Python three. Yeah, everything in Python three is is Unicode. So you know what this should, and then Unicode I think has um. Uh, now this is in Spanish, uh, which is bad. I do not really speak Spanish, aside from um, when I was in high school and stuff. But I feel like uh, high school is kind of a uh, what is that? It's like a Bellman. Not a Bellman Ford, but uh, the logical fallacy in news where something you know about is mis misreported. Uh, it's like the the Gelman fallacy. in media uh oh here it is 
the Gelman amnesia uh, fallacy. So, you know, what this is, is the phenomenon of people trusting newspapers for topics which they are not knowledgeable about, um, despite recognizing when you are knowledgeable about something that the story is deeply flawed in a lot of really critical ways. So it's, it's this kind of amnesia where okay, I remember, you know, I, I can't recognize or remember the fact that when they were talking about something I knew a lot about, they were talking complete nonsense. But now when they're talking something I know nothing about, I'm assuming that it, it's legit and they know, you know, this is valuable information that, that they're uh, talking about because I know nothing of the subject to prove it otherwise. Um, and I'm making, you know, I'm forgetting the fact that when they did talk about what I knew about, they were talking complete nonsense. So, like, I feel like in school, and this is a huge a tangent, so I'm going to try to keep this really short. Uh, foreign languages are kind of like this. It's like, you know, I, I speak English. I uh, know math to an extent. You, you know, It's like you learn all these things in school. But you, you have this amnesia where it's like, you know, I was supposed to learn a foreign language. I spent a lot of time on that. I, you know, was graded on that and, and a lot of time and effort. I don't know a foreign language at all. So, like, you know, how well do I know anything else in school if they weren't able to teach me something so measurable as to whether or not you can speak and understand and read in another language besides your own? I mean, that's really easy to to measure as far as I know and the same thing with like gym you know I can't do a pull-up and like I was supposed to be in in gym class and like you know learning about phys fitness and stuff it's like do I really know how to speak English do I really know how to speak math I mean it, it's for for these really easily measurable things um I did not make any progress in at all. So like, you know, how is getting an A in Spanish, but not knowing any Spanish, a different thing than getting an A in math and English. And, and then, okay, now you're an expert in math and English. Like, like, you know, it, it's to me that that feels like the Gelman amnesia effect where, you know, I'm deeply knowledgeable about how good I am at fitness and how uh, good well I speak a foreign language, uh, but then something I'm not so deeply knowledgeable about, like you know how how well do I speak my own language? How well can I do complex mathematics, which is a such a giant field that you barely even touch the surface of? Um, you know, I walk away thinking I speak good English and and I'm decent at math. Um, when at the same time I walk away knowing for a fact that I don't know any Spanish and, uh, and I um, am not physically fit despite having PE classes for most of my education. So uh, anyways, this, this is definitely uh, <laughs> this is definitely off topic, so I apologize for that. Uh, I will be uh, I think I think we went through everything. We did the conversion to, uh, to binary, uh, uh, to clear up my confusion. So each, each of these, uh, characters represents, uh, three, uh, by bi three, uh, binary digits. So you've got the, the two, four, six. So you can only have a, uh, seven is, is the, uh, maximum, uh, decimal value there. So if we were to have, um, so here we have the four places on, then the, uh, or sorry, the, yeah, the four places on, then the uh, twos places on, and then the, the zero, or zero places on, so, or, or the ones place. So here's the ones place, the two place, the four place. So to represent a one, um, we switch this on uh, to represent a two, uh, we switch, uh, it, it would look like, uh, it would look like this. So, I mean, this is deep in the weeds. Hopefully, you know, use the calculator, use the tools. But understanding this to some extent, I think, is important. Um, so each of these represents only three bytes, and that's why we have a maximum value of seven. 
because if we want to represent eight, we need a fourth uh, byte. Um, so uh, eight would be represented with four zero. Let's see if we've got any eights in here. Uh, any four zero. I don't see any. I don't see any four zeros. Uh, yeah, I don't see any values of eight being represented here. Uh, I think this is a value of uh, 16. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, I need to stop embarrassing myself here. That was a long time ago in school that I learned that. So uh, we'll move on to the guided exercises, but first I'll take a little break. So I'll be right back. All right, welcome back. So moving on to the guided exercises at the 45 minute mark, I kind of uh, can't keep on topic today, uh, but uh, yeah, we should be able to finish this out in one go. So first guided exercise, someone just donated a laptop to your school and now you wish to install Linux on it. There is no manual, uh, it, well, <laughs> and you were forced to boot it to a USB thumb drive with no graphics whatsoever. Um, and assumingly you have no internet, uh, you do get a shell terminal and you know for every processor you have, there will be a line for it in the uh, forward slash proc forward slash CPU info file. Take a look at that, my home lab. So forward slash, so it's a file, so we'll cat it out. Proc CPU info, there we go. Using the commands grep and wc, display how many processors you have. To have. All right, so let's do that. So uh, we can match on uh, the word processor with grep. Pipe grep processor. There we go. And now we've got all the processors. Um, we don't want to uh, waste time uh, counting that manually. So then we can grep that output to wc. And in this first column, we can see the answer is 24. Um, the other thing we can do is uh, narrow, narrow that down further um, for like scripting or whatever. You know, as I mentioned, uh, string manipulations can get sloppy. So uh, we just narrow it down to the, the number of lines, which is this first column here uh, with WC-L. And there's my answer, 24. Uh, here, the answer, I'm not sure what it is. So now we need to do the same thing but we need to use SED instead of uh, grep. So let me try to figure that out here. So uh, I'm gonna do a, a help on SED. Now we do have a file here. It's the uh, forward slash proc forward slash GPU info. So uh, we're going to enter in the script syntax. So it should be so let's get the man file on SCD because maybe uh, we can see the scripting syntax. Okay, so here's, uh, let's see here. So we can do SCD, there we go. And then we can match the lines matching the regular expression. So let's try that as the first thing we do. So we're going to do SED and the regular uh, expression going to be processor and then we'll feed it the file which is proc uh, CPU info. Oh, and we're actually missing a command. And I wish there was like a man option to just print it out outside of the uh, pager. Uh, that's the physical location. Uh, because I just want to see the man page without being stuck, without it going away when I close it. 
so I guess I could just open another connection to it and do it that way. But I kind of want to see it all in one terminal because if you're doing like terminal logging and stuff, it's just uh, better. All right, well, you know what? I'm going to do it that way. So SSH gposh at 192.168.1.5. There we go, and then uh, clear man SED. There we go. So so now now we've got it uh, looking good. Um, so we want the uh, okay. Oh, you know what? I think I, well, hmm, okay. So, this this is to, this is swap. Uh, this is label, uh, another thing for label. Uh, the following address types may be used. All input. Why? Why can't I do it like this? Man, SED is garbage. It's really hard to tell how to use this thing. Oh my God. How do I use this? Missing a command in character 11. Maybe I need to give it the, like a dash R for, for read or like, how do I use this thing? Uh, I guess I'll, it's not really cheating to look through my history, even though it is. Okay, so you you need a, a dash I maybe? What does the dash I do? Edit files. Okay, no, I don't want to do that. Um so here's here's the syntax. So I was right kind of uh with the syntax, but um why was I I'm so confused. I don't know. I might have to just look at the answer on this one. Uh, yeah, th this this ma documentation is not good. Because it's, you know, it's a programming language. You you have to give it the correct syntax here and it's it's hard to see what that syntax is. Um, append. Don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. Uh, all I want to do is uh, have some fun. I have a feeling I'm not the only one. Okay, well, shoot. Uh, they don't even have like examples in here of how to use it. This is really bad. It's kind of a good uh, example of like how far we've gone in computing. Like if you compare this to the Python request module, it's like this is this is like not intended to be read by anyone. <laughs> Man, ah, oh, that's really bad. 
Well, I mean, I guess I'll just look at the answer. I mean, you can do it like this. I, I, maybe that'll work. Nope, that won't work. Okay, well, you know what? I'm just gonna look at the answer for this one because I, I you know, it's not clear. Oh, and it has, what? That's lame. Okay, so the answer to the first one was using the commands grep and wc, display how many processors you have. So here are two options. Let's see what option I went I went with. So I went with, um, so you can do cat, yep, um, and then pipe the output to, uh, to pipe grep and then wc-l, yep, that's the option I went with. There's also a second option, you can just use grep processor on the file and then dash l. Um, now that you know there are several ways you can do the same thing, when should you be using one or the other? Uh, it really depends on several factors, the two most important ones being performance and readability. Most of the time you will use shell commands inside shell scripts to automate your tasks and the larger and more complex your scripts become, the more you need to worry about keeping them fast. So which one is faster? Let's ask the AI. Okay, so determining which process is faster among several ways of accomplishing the same task depends on the specific context and the implementation details of each method. Without knowing the specific methods or commands being applied, it's difficult to provide a definitive answer. So we're going to say these are the significant, com these are the, uh, these are the two commands to choose from. Choose from which is faster let's say number one is cat proc cpu info grep processor wc dash l and then number two grep processor proc cpu info and i misspelled this so i'll fix that there we go um Pipe WC dash L. All right, ask. So, okay, here we go. So, in the provided comparison, the second command, grep processor, um, just using grep without, without another pipe, is likely to be faster than the first command for a couple of reasons. The second command directly uses the grep command to search for the word processor in the file. This eliminates the need for, for cat, so you don't need to, to use an extra uh, application. You can just use one application, and you can just use two applications, wc and grep. By directly specifying the file to search, the command avoids unnecessary overhead. The, the second command uses wc-l command to count the number of lines in the output of grep. This is a straightforward operation that requires less processing compared to the first command, which uses uh, wcl after two pipe operations. So the, like the more pipe operations you have, the more actual applications you're running and like spinning up an application uh, adds a lot of delay. So it's it's intermediate steps with a pipe is an intermediate step which can uh, make things run slower so this the reason you would use something like sed which is so sloppy and annoying is because it's significantly faster because you're just using that one application instead of booting up three different applications just to do something that one application can do on its own um where in this case two two for one so all right, so do the same thing with SED instead of grep. Now, instead of grep, we will try this with SED. Uh, and uh, honestly, I don't know what they're talking about here. So they're doing a dash N, so do man uh, SED. 
and we've got dash n which is uh, silent so presses automatically printing of, of of pattern space and then we've got this uh, so I was on the right track with this but now they have a forward slash p so what does that mean Yeah, I don't see a forward slash p mentioned anywhere in the documentation. So I I don't know what the forward slash p means. Uh, I guess I'll try the help. Oh, here's a p. So print the current pattern space. Okay, but it's not clear that it comes after a forward slash. Yeah, it's it's very unclear. How to how to actually use this, which is I think a sign of the times. You know, this is a. Let's see here. Uh, when is the publish? The publishing date should be on here. Uh, copyright. Ah, uh, it's copyrighted in 2017. Okay, so maybe it's not even an older program. I don't even know. Here's info. Uh, it looks like this info command okay this info command gives you examples and, and actually shows you uh, better information so that's good to know you can just use info um, but let's type in what they got here uh, processor so dash n uh, makes it uh, silent n for silent and then dash p uh, prints it out so dash n makes it so it doesn't print anything out and then dash p makes it so that it does print things out I really don't understand this command dash l and you can't even get rid of the wc dash l using it so yeah it seems pretty worthless to me but um, uh, that's the answer let's try taking the dash p the p out so now we got a missing command. So this section of this syntax is, is the command. So the command is to print. There we go. And then let's try taking the dash n out at the beginning. Uh, it's an option fed to SED, not a part of the SED language syntax. And now we've got uh, a, the wrong answer. We've got 672. So not sure what that dash n does. Um, if we do a SED dash dash help, we can see that the dash n suppresses automatic printing of pattern space. So I guess we get the pattern space plus the results or, or just the pattern space without the result. But uh, the dash, uh, without the dash n, we got uh, the wrong answer. So it's important to uh, include that. Here we used SED with the dash n parameter, so SED will not print anything except for what matches with the expression processor as instructed by the p command, as we did in the grep solutions. WC-L will count the number of lines, thus the number of processors we have. Um, so study this next example. Okay, we'll enter that in. And now, now we're piping SED into SED, which is uh, simple and straightforward. <laughs> Now we know in bash single quotes means literal characters but uh this is something fed to sed so i don't know if it's the same thing this command sequence provides identical results to the previous example where the output of sed was piped into a wc command the difference here is that instead of using wc-l to count the number of lines sed is again invoked to provide equivalent functionality once more, we are suppressing the output of SED with the dash n uh, option, except for the expression that we are explicitly calling, which is uh, dollar sign equals in wrapped in single quotes. This expression cell tells SED to match the last line, dollar sign, and then print out that line number. So equal sign stands for a uh, uh, line uh, number. And so we're printing out the line number of the last line. That'll give us the total lines 
uh, in the file. All right, so uh, I got to end it here. I have something coming up very soon, um, and I don't want to miss that. So when we come back, uh, we'll be doing um, the second uh, guided exercise. Let me make sure my uh, navigation is, is ready to go here. It is not. Um, Okay, so this this looks this looks good, I think. Uh yep, okay. All right, so that's it. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.